Hi, I'm Dave Kittredge, filmmaker in Los Angeles, and this is The Outcast, presented by Outfest, where we have conversations with LGBT creators and allies to discuss their work, their inspirations, their passions, and the challenges of getting our authentic voices heard. And today, talk about an authentic voice. I am so happy to have acclaimed, award-winning writer-director Justin Simeon with me today. Hello, Justin. Hey, David. How are you doing? I'm great. I am so thrilled to have you here. Given we're recording this in early summer 2020, like in June, uh, looking back on your show uh, and movie, but mostly, like, especially season one of your show, Dear White People, that's a little bit creepy prescient, um, (laughs) uh, which is not, I guess, creepy because the shit's been happening forever, but, you know, I I did note... Uh, in the news that it got, what, a 300 or 400% uptick in viewers? Yeah, I think it was like 329 or something. Um, yeah, and it's a it's a weird feeling because, you know, it's hard to be like, I told you so, when it's like racism and like, you know, black people dying. But it also, unfortunately, like it was, it's not so much prescient as it was, it was part of the present of that moment. And um, it still is. And... You know, I think for me, it feels humbling and good that something I've made that often I felt is overlooked and not really sort of um, given the flowers it deserves can at least be helpful and contribute to this moment in some way, because it's I mean, it's really what I've been pouring my my life into for six years. It's an amazing show. And it's actually uh I mean, and we can go back to because I want to hear about, you know, kind of how you came to it, how you made the movie back in 2014. Actually, you shot it in 2013. Uh, It went to Sundance. It became uh, or was adapted into a Netflix show. But it's a very it's a very poignant moment. And and I know you've been outspoken about Black Lives Matter um, on your on your Twitter feed, on on other places that you've talked. Um, What is it about this moment that kind of boiled everything over? Why did it catch now? I think part of it is the pandemic, the fact that we are in control of so little of what's happening in society right now. And, you know, with just the sociopath in chief, um, I think people were just really frustrated, especially seeing the pass that he gave to armed, fully armed, quote unquote, protesters of, you know, lockdown restrictions, which are necessary to save people's lives. And seeing that sort of immediately lead to the reopening of of all 50 states um it it was just kind of like well well we're gonna protest a real thing now and see what Mm. can happen and i think i think honestly it was it's a combination of just having people's attention for the first time uh at least a large group of people outside of the black community's attention uh on the issue and and you just can't you can't not see the hypocrisy um this time. I mean, I've been shocked at the amount of times where people seem to not see the hypocrisy or not see that this is an issue worth standing up for, but it, it just seemed like we were at some kind of breaking point and this was a last straw. And, you know, it's encouraging, but I, I have to say it's also familiar. You know, as a black person, I've been here before. I've, you know, even though I was a kid when the LA riots happened, like this is a, this is a pattern that happens sort of that I'm used to of, of the world suddenly caring about black people and, protesting and all this stuff and then you know we have another reason to do so just the next year you know and so i i am i'm optimistic because this does feel different um but i'm also not sold well i mean as you should be <laughs> I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic i, should I mean say. what do you think is necessary for this particular moment to have more i guess legs than than previous moments I think, um, you know, I think it's an endurance thing. It's sort of there's a lot of issues to clean up here and they're actually very, very complicated. And they're not um, it's not as simple as uh, I think we all wish it were. You know, I think the defund the police movement is really interesting because it's getting people to talk about and understand, um, you know, the the role of government and society in a new way, which is really exciting. Um, But then every segment of government, of business, of culture of society has a racist issue or set of issues um, that are different and need untangling and need to be dealt with seriously. Because what begins to happen is that um, in movements like these, as we sort of support one issue, 
everyone's issues begin to be unbearable because, you know, I've been I've been living with systemic racism in my section or my sector of, um, you know, of, of the United States. And so if we're going to deal with that one over here, we got to deal with mine, too. And it's really like, OK, great. I'm excited. Are you, it seems like people are listening. Um, are you guys really ready to roll up your sleeves and do the work? Because the truth is, is that racism is a, a white person's created problem. You know, black people are affected by it. But the reason we're affected by it is because we don't have the same kind of power and privilege um, in the system as white people do. So it as always as it always kind of has been is up to um, how how far do white, are white people willing to, to fight for this and, and go for this and see that it's actually in their best interest? Well, I, I will say for the first time that I can remember uh, speaking as a white guy, um, I'm hearing other white people not in big cities like in the sticks start to have very uncomfortable conversations with each other and with, you know, people of color. And I think for a lot of people, it's been a really eye-opening experience. I mean, for me, it's been an eye-opening experience. And I thought I was reasonably, like, you know, woke. I thought I was reasonably, like, aware. Right. Um, but I have to say, I was really blind on a lot of things. And I think I cannot possibly be alone. Yeah. And and I think um, it's it's interesting because as a black creative who's been speaking to these issues, you know, like, by the time I get to season one of Dear White People, I'm like, I can't just say the same thing thing again i mean they weren't some people listened when it was a movie but not everybody really listened but i can't keep saying the same thing or can i or you know so it's 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 um you know it's interesting i was going back through like dear white people footage and and going oh my god we've talked we've been talking about this for years and years and years um so it's it's great that people are listening finally but it's also a little like do you want a cookie you know what i mean i'm like great thank you <laughs> welcome to the party um you don't get a here... gold star for showing up yeah we've been here for a minute so uh <laughs> you know let's see if there's some more ice in the back but welcome <laughs> Uh, <laughs> you know, it's, it's kind of my feeling, but it's, but it's, it's, I'm cautiously optimistic. What can I say? Well, one of the things, and you touched on this and, and going back to kind of your own experience, because you are a creative, you are in the entertainment industry, you are black and you are also gay. And these are, these are both things that you deal with, not only in Dear White People, but in your life. And, and you get discrimination, I'm sure, from both ways. I mean, I've gotten discrimination by a gay guy, but as a white guy, you know, racially, it's like, you know, nothing. Sure. I, don't, I don't have to think about that. Um, but I should. And this is part of what, you know, has kind of led me to that conclusion. When you bring issues of sexuality in with the black community, and there's been this longstanding on a perception, I guess, um, uh, of the black community kind of being more hostile toward gay people than other communities. Um, it's been propagated. It's been, you know, you can look at the down on Prop 8 from 2008, you know, in one way or another. I know Tanishi Coates, like, kind of debunked a lot of the crap behind that. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, how is it, I guess, being an African-American and a gay creator dealing with all of these issues mostly all at the same time well you know for me it can be sometimes confusing because i think the perception is that they are different issues but the fact is that they are the same issue um white patriarchal attitudes are, are, are the reason why we have rampant homophobia in any community and because you know black folks are under the thumb of of white supremacy um it was necessary, frankly, and inevitable that the black community adopt a lot of these attitudes. You know, um, like I was just watching uh, Making the Cut, the Russell Simmons documentary, and it pointed out that misogyny was not invented by hip hop. It was um, it was absorbed by hip hop because misogyny existed in every music form before hip hop. So it's sort of like, OK, so we so we've we, you know, as a black community, we've absorbed a lot of these attitudes um, against homosexuality, against women, um, really even again, you know, even if you go all the way back to the slaves that were brought here against their native religions and beliefs, um, you know, th th these people were thoroughly colonized and were really you had to ex you had to adopt the white supremacist patriarchal attitudes of the time if you were to survive. And so part of this is unpacking what of this is is actually innate to the black community. Like what of these issues um, are actually ours or, and what of them did we just absorb? And unpacking all of that and parsing all of that is a very complicated process. Um, but I have to say that 
you know, the more and more I make space to be myself and to um, sort of say what I have to say, the more welcome I feel in my own community. And one of the things that that Lionel, uh, the character who is very loosely, is I would say a much more neurotic version of me, and I'm pretty neurotic, but he's <laughs> he's even more so. Um, you know, one of the things that he realizes is, this, is that this idea that black people will not accept him is actually a myth. It's actually a um, misconception that he has absorbed uh, from both white and black media. Uh, and that actually when he shows up as himself, yes, there are moments, but by and large, um, people are happy that he's there and, 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 and are happy that he is contributing. And, that, and you know, I know that that's not a universal experience for people everywhere. Um, but it is an experience that one can have within the black community. And um, I think that's an important thing to, to say, too. Well, I also think it's important that you as an African-American and I was going to say entertainer, but like creator, I guess, is more more apt, are so out. I mean, you basically were never not out from what I can tell from an, all of my <laughs> research. I mean, you know, uh, on your Wikipedia pages, so like, you know, he came out at Sundance and I'm just like, I, I think he was pretty much out before that, wasn't he? <laughs> yeah, I was. I've been out since. I mean, I've been a version of out, I think, probably since high school and, and college. But if in terms of the career, there really was that moment, because I guess, you know, I don't know if I read gay or straight. I guess it kind of depends on who you are and what your interactions are with gay people. But, you know, at Sundance, I knew that not everybody knew if I was gay or not. And, and I remember feeling it to be very important that the first time I had like a public moment to not only mention that I was gay, but sort of, you know, bring up the fact that that was very much a part of my uh, my voice. Because, you know, when I was a kid and when I was growing up, when I wanted to be a filmmaker, there weren't other gay black men really in the culture. And a lot of what made me feel so alienated and isolated is that, you know, people in positions of power were just so afraid to speak up and be themselves. And so I'll be honest, at Sundance, it was a little awkward because I kind of had to push it. Like, I remember someone asking, like, um, I think what happened was a Q, it was the first Q&A for Dear White People. And someone was like, you know, well, I'm just curious about, uh, I think, forget exactly how they said it, but I'm just curious about why you chose to explore the gay, this gay character, this gay identity. I was like, well, I'm gay. And, you know, I just sort of <laughs> made it part of the answer because I knew that, you know, if I was going to be a public person in any way that other black gay men out there especially needed to see um, another gay black man who, you know, acts the way I act, talks the way I talk, dresses the way I dress, right. is me in all, all the ways that I'm me, but also gay and also black. And yes, those things go together. Do you think that, uh, and I know this is true for me, uh, but do you think that being gay kind of puts you on the outside so much so that you had the opportunity to kind of invent who you were or discover who you were in a way that, that maybe straight people kind of are hemmed into an idea of what they're supposed to be. And, and a lot of people just don't question it because it works. Yeah, I, I think that there's something very special about the gay spirit. I mean, uh, you know, Native American communities were smart enough to recognize that gay people and trans people, um, they're, they're presenting something really new and exciting <laughs> to the human species. And there are different cultures over time that, you know, held a very special place for queer people. And um, and so for those reasons, yes, absolutely. Anytime a person is marginalized, um, there's a possibility to turn that marginalization into something beneficial. And I was able to do that. Um, but there are a lot of peers that were not able to do that, you know. So I think in some ways, yeah, being gay and being gay in a household where when I eventually did come out, you know, I wasn't kicked out of out of my house, um, you know, and and having other honestly, things that just feel like I was really lucky um, made it so that I could turn that experience into something meaningful. But I have friends who didn't make it out of their adolescence and didn't make it out of their 20s right. um, and didn't make it through coming out to their families. And, um, you know, I, I just consider myself lucky. Season one of Dear White People, it doesn't kind of tread the same space as the movie but it kind of goes over part of what the movie was was doing toward yeah. the end so they they kind of go they're kind of of a piece so 
Um, I don't know where the the movie's available. It was on Netflix. I th- it might still be. I don't know. But I'm but, not sure. I mean, it's you know, it's anywhere you get any movie from. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> sort of like, you, can, you, know. you can rent it. But <laughs> yeah. but if you have not, I just cannot even tell anybody enough. If you have not watched the television show, um, do so. It's um, it's really, really, really amazing and important. And uh, as we said, prescient. Uh, although not really because, I mean, because the shit has been going on, as we said, I mean, it is uncomfortable. And, and, and I think that more people like me, like white people need to be more uncomfortable for just a little bit, at least yeah. to look at stuff that's going on. I mean, and I think that's kind of the takeaway. And it's also, you know, the show is not designed to be just like, you know, half hour, just sheer uncomfortability. I mean, I would say watching... No, it's hilarious! Br- yeah, I would say watching a British comedy is more uncomfortable than watching <laughs> Dear White People. You know, it's it's intentionally designed to be a safe space where everyone can laugh at themselves. Black people, white people, uh, brown people, and, um, and sort of like, it, it's a satire, you know, uh, because I thought, I felt like these issues... They kind of require humility of all of us um, to really have these conversations. Um, and so, you know, the show is meant to be enjoyed as well. But yeah, I mean, I think that when you say prescient, I mean, there are moments that really do startle me. For instance, um, in the pitch deck for Dear White People, when we started shoot, when we started coming up with the show, uh, we had yet to elect President Trump, but we were at the end of, you know, Obama's term. And I remember putting something in the in the show Bible, like in the pitch of how by the time the show as a joke, by the time the show comes out, you know, we'll all be living under the Trump dictatorship. And then, of course, that's what happened. And, you know, I remember the, the last day we shot the season finale um, of season one was the day he won. Oh and God. I mean, I just can't explain to you what that felt like coming into work almost celebratory because we all knew Hillary was going to win. And shooting this show and over the course of the day of shooting Dear White People realizing, you know, in fact, that wasn't going to happen. I just remember being stuck in traffic and just sort of screaming at the top of my lungs because, you know, what I had sort of predicted in jest actually happened. And, you know, one thing I think a lot of black people learn is you prepare for the worst and hope for the best. And, you know, when the show finally came out, it was it was it felt like that. It was like, well, I'm at least I'm glad we made the show. Oh, God. I think people need it. But. God, Lee. And I have to say that the the finale of season one is one of the more powerful and startling finales of any remotely comical show, at least, I've ever seen. I Thank mean, you. it's amazing. You. you directed the first and last episodes of all three seasons so far, I think, yes. and a couple others in there as well. Yeah. Mm-hmm. When, I know this is the big question, when... Are we getting season four? I don't know. I mean, we we've written it. Um, we are waiting to figure out when all the COVID restrictions are sort of aligned to where we can shoot what we've wrote. Um, obviously, financially, every TV show is in a bit of a quandary because we've all accrued a lot of costs. Right. Um, sort of being closed this time. So we, we've, you know, my show... If it's anything, it's ambitious. So we have a few little, <laughs> we have a few little things to, a few little ducks to get in a row. But you know, I think we're all hoping to shoot season four as soon as possible. Well, I want to talk about the ambition because the ambition is twofold. Uh, narratively, uh, g- even going back to the movie, it's ridiculously ambitious. I mean, this is a multi-protagonist story. Now you can that can work better. Over, you know, episodes of a television show, I know, uh, you know, a lot of the shows uh, in season one, most of it was like, um, you know, each one had a character. Yeah. Not just narratively, like the look of this stuff. I was going to say this film, but because it feels like just one long, honestly, just one long movie. The look is gorgeous. (laughs) The production design is gorgeous. I mean, it is a gorgeous, lush looking show. I just want to live there, honestly. I know. I know. I wanted you to want to live there because, I, you know, I, I knew that this was going to be some hard stuff. And what I love, I mean, I love cinema. I just love cinema. And and I love that cinema, um, even when it's sort of taking you through some really dark places, uh, has this quality that just makes you, you know, when it's done a certain way, um, makes you just want to be there. You know, I, I like I, Barry Lyndon um, is a big influence on the movie. Uh, and that's really interesting. I would not yeah. have like I'm a huge Kubrick fan. I would I see it when you say it. I would not have thought of it, but yeah, yeah. I can totally see it. 
there was a there was a relationship between certain movies and certain characters in my head uh, in that movie. And um, but the thing about Barry Lyndon, it's a very melancholy and sad film. But I I find myself always wanting to just be in that world. That is the power of cinema. It it sort of it brings us into spaces that we maybe were afraid to go. And so um, it was important that the show maintain that quality and that you know yes we are dealing with difficult and hard and uncomfortable topics but i also wanted you to feel like you were eating it like candy you know you weren't eating your vegetables you were sort of in this kind of aspirational place with these really witty and articulate black people and um you know we weren't gonna we were gonna be unflinching in the things that we talked about but we were gonna make sure you had a good time while you were there um and 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 it's just because i you know I love it. I love cinema. I love what we came up with creatively in the movie. And I surrounded myself with other artists and craftspeople who also really love uh, what they do and have a point of view. And, you know, really just tried to give them an environment to be great. Well, the passion, because one of the things you you know about Barry Lyndon, if you ever saw it, Stanley Kubrick's movie from 1975, uh, it's an enormously passionate film. Uh, and yes. very lush. But one of the things that's very different about what you do, and I'm going to shout out our mutual friend Philip Bartell, along with your editorial <laughs> staff, uh, the editing in this thing is so snappy. It's so fast. It's so good. It's It just moves like a, a, like a train, this, yeah. this show. It's yeah. amazing. Yeah, it's, it's, it's definitely... Um... You know, it's cut. It's cut for comedy, and and a lot of that too uh, has to do with Yvette Lee Bowser, who was our uh, co showrunner for the first three seasons, and um, you know has a sense of sort of sitcom timing. I mean, she created Living Single, and you know, in some areas where I can be sort of wanting to linger forever, you know, she would sometimes sense like, oh, but I think. You know, I think shorter in this case would be better. And she's right. And it's and it's it's a thing that I've had to sort of learn and unlearn as I cut different things, you know, because we sort of with Dear White People, we Philip and I and the rest of the editors would get into this rhythm of comedy cutting that say wouldn't necessarily work for like bad hair, which is my thriller. Uh, that's coming oh, and out I want to talk year. about that. I so want to talk about that. I am dying to see that. Yeah, you'll get a chance. <laughs> <laughs> we're gonna very we're gonna get, soon. It was it, uh, just so everyone knows. Bad hair. It's your new movie. It premiered at Sundance. It was picked up by Hulu for a gajillion dollars. I wish it was a gajillion. Well, it was, it was a good amount of money. I mean, <laughs> it was you know, eight but, million. But, but yeah, well, I'll take you it. You know what? In 2020 world, that's pretty damn good. I'll it was take one, it. I'll one take of the it. biggest pickups out of Sundance, and I can't wait to see it. But uh, but going back, we're gonna talk about that in a minute. Going back to the pacing and the editorial. I mean, you see it in some of the episodes. And 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 I mean I I remember specifically the Barry Jenkins directed episode in season one where uh, the party where Reggie gets the gun pulled on him by campus security, that thing runs and you're you're in this world and you're in this scene and it's very jovial and it's very fast paced and then the shit starts to get real and it feels like time slows and stops and it is just unbearable to watch. Uh, it, but in a really great way. So I don't want yeah. anyone not watching it, but it's like it, it it takes a lot of craft to pull off stuff like that, to pull off a moment like that. That's almost indelible. Yeah. And we took it very seriously, you know, from the writing stage um, through to Barry's directing of it, which was very careful and considerate. And um, also, you know, we had it was very emotional. Uh, you know, that scene where Reggie gets the gun pulled on him, we really had to stop shooting multiple times because the cast was getting so overwhelmed by the moment. It was so real, you know, and you can feel it in the performances. But, um, yeah, it was a it was a very hot set. It, and uh, we had to take really good care of our people. And even in the edit, you know, really figure out how to find it and and let it unfold organically. It was not an obvious um thing but it was it was something i had wanted to do since the movie uh that entire episode was actually based on the on this extended scene that was cut from the film where uh, yeah where troy and lionel sort of walk through campus and have this sort of night of just conversation uh and it, it sort of ends in this tragic way and and i took it out of the movie and you have to understand when the movie came out black lives matter was still very nascent uh and you know we were still in that phase where like 
it was actually if a black person kind of brought up racism, we were shamed because white people who had voted for Obama were so certain that they weren't racist, that there really wasn't room for much conversation. And that's kind of the world that the movie comes out in with the show. We were in a world where, no, we can talk about big things again and and take them seriously, especially in seasons two and three. I mean, especially after, you know, because the movie was shot in in 2013 and it yeah. premiered in 2014. Uh, the, the first uh, season of the show, I mean, as you said, you, you know, you were shooting in 2016 and came out in 2017 in a very, very, very different world. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's it's been it's I mean, honestly, just watching it. I mean, not just that it's a great piece of filmmaking, this show, but it's been, if not educational, at least it brought to my attention the severity and the the perniciousness of a lot of the stuff. Yeah. And thank you. And. And also, it's a it's an intellectual show, it's a comedy, but we're also going for the heart, you know? We just, at the end of the day, I just want you to see yourself in these people. If you're black and you don't get to see yourself in television or in movies or in the culture, you get to see yourself in these people. If you're not black, but you never thought, oh, a girl like that and me have something in common, or a boy like that, and me, ha- if you never, you know, you get to see yourselves in people that you maybe normally wouldn't get to see yourself, and you, I think, you know, you and I both know this because we are of marginalized communities, but, like, gay people have to see themselves in heterosexual romantic comedies and yeah. uh, uh, television yeah. shows all of the time. Black people, we have to see ourselves in white people. Um, it it actually is not a bad thing. There's There's something really cinema is an empathy machine and and it sort of allows you to see yourself in people's faces that you normally wouldn't see humanity in and um and that's also the goal of the show we just want you to love them and care about what happens to them as well as just dissect and talk about the issues that are important to them well you completely succeed i love all of these people and i cannot i cannot (laughs) i cannot wait for season four want to know more about outfest of course you do you're listening to this podcast outfest is the only lgbtqia arts media and entertainment nonprofit organization in the world whose programs empower artists communities and filmmakers alike to transform the world through their stories while also supporting the entire life cycle of their career from outset to legacy and what that means is it is one of the largest lgbt film festivals in the world and one of the largest film festivals in north america also outfest has a tremendous number of programs for young filmmakers as well as archivists preserving gay stories for all time it is a truly outstanding organization and especially right now we would love your help please go to outfest.org and learn how you can become a member of this fantastic organization I do want to go back to just how you kind of came up. Um, you know, you were born in Texas. Yes. Uh, when did you move to L.A.? Steers and queers. Um, <laughs> I moved to L.A. Well, I went to college. I went to college at a place called Chapman University in 01, from 01 to 05. And that's like Orange County. Um, and then right when I finished film school in 2005, um, I got a job at Focus Features uh, as a publicity assistant. And so that would be the formal move to Los Angeles. And uh, I worked in PR for about eight years after that. Oh, boy. Until uh, I got my break, which was Dear White People. How much was Chapman University like Winchester University? Oh, boy. Um <laughs> There were definitely some moments there that inspired uh, Dear White People. Um, I think the thing about Chapman was that within the film school, which was a much more uh, international uh, school, um, you know, you would encounter very liberal, open-minded people, uh, people of color, uh, gay folks, all queer folks. Um, But overall, the school was and is very uh, white. And there, at least when I went there, there was a contingent of the population of white students who were incredibly conservative, some of whom were closeted, honey, closeted <laughs> with their little girlfriends, and I knew better, and really were offended by the thought that they could be racist and, and just refused to look at themselves. Um, and so there was that contingent there. Um, but I would say Winchester is, 
It's inspired a little bit by that. It's inspired by a little bit of research about the Ivies, but it's also Winchester is a, you know, it's a it's an analogy for America, for any space where people are competing at the highest levels of capitalism, right? Uh, and you know, ambition, and you know, but but yeah, there were certain there were certain moments from my my time at Chapman that absolutely became moments in the show and 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 in the film. How long did it take you to write the film? Oh boy, years. I mean, I think the first draft I wrote in two thousand five, oh my and uh, but I finally got to a draft in two thousand twelve that I felt, and this is over years of just casually getting together with friends and writers groups over the weekend and working on drafts and trying to self-educate because I knew I wanted to make a, a multi-protagonist movie. I loved multi-protagonist movies. Oh, but me nobody too. Ever, They're my favorite. They're, they're so, so my great. favorite. I love them. I love but them no, so much. But nobody ever teaches you how to write them. And, and most like screenwriting books are like, don't do that. Like, you're not Altman. Write a single protagonist you know, story. And so um, I, I had to figure out, I had to write many terrible drafts of that movie um, before I arrived at one that I thought was readable and, you know, that I thought I could get produced. Um, so it, it took a really long time to get to a place where I thought the movie was resonating and working with people. Uh, but yeah, 2012 is, is about the time I was like, okay, I can make a version of this movie. I still, you know, the version that we eventually shot was still very different, but uh, I felt by then I could, I could actually get it going. Well, you're also a, a huge student of cinema. Um, I knew this about you going in. You dropped Barry Lyndon. I mean, you know, I, <laughs> what I mean, especially for multi protagonist movies, like where did you go for inspiration? Where did you go, you know, to kind of learn how to do this and kind of how to balance everything? Well, um, I, I would say Altman is the first stop to figuring out a multi protagonist movie. But the thing about Altman movies is that they're so sprawling that I, I recognize that I couldn't shoot that version of Dear White People. And so, um, you know, uh, Do the Right Thing became a really important uh, film. So did Election and so did Fame, because all three wow. of those all three of those films um, are multi protagonists. But they uh, as you move through each act of the movie, they really do kind of focus on one or two characters. So, you know, Election is a multi protagonist movie, but we think of it as Tracy's movie. But it, it really is. Tracy's movie and Matthew's movie, Matthew Broderick's movie, um, and Reese Witherspoon's movie, and um, and Fame. Likewise, sometimes you're relating to Montgomery, sometimes you're relating relating to Doris, um, and in Do the Right Thing, some you know it's you go from bugging out to uh, um, you know Mookie to mother sister, and so this sort of this concept of like instead of it being about all of these people all of the time, which is what Robert Altman is doing in something like Nashville, those movies are a little bit more selective about when we're in one point of view. It's more about point of view shifting than sort right. of telling a lot of stories at once. And so for me, it was about recognizing that this was a tradition and that even though there weren't maybe a bunch of books about how to work it, there were many examples, um, both in my genre of like satire comedy and outside of. And so I just watched as much as I could over and over again, just so it would kind of soak into my bone marrow. And, um, and and there are some books out there that address multi-protagonist screenwriting, but I just I just tried to immerse myself because I was trying to write something I didn't know how to, and that that typically is is how I educate myself in some area of, of cinema. I'm trying to write something that I don't really know how to, or I'm I'm trying to make something that I've never made before, and so I have to research. I have to dig deep. Well, you bring up Altman, and Altman, you know, the way his movies worked in that period, like the Mash Nashville kind of era. They had a script, but the script was largely kind of like sh put aside and, and actors were given a lot of real estate to kind of like invent their own stuff as compared to something like a Boogie Nights or or Do the Right Thing. Do the Right Thing was scripted within an inch of its life mm -hmm. um, uh, or something like, I guess, you know, I'm going to bring it up. School Days, which you actually yeah. have a cute little shout out to in season one. Some, someone's ringtone uh, is the <laughs> wake up uh, climax. I get the sense, though, that you're much more kind of like scripted, you know, you, you want to go in there with a plan. You're not I don't see you. I don't see you improving like crazy like Altman. Yeah. I mean, the truth is, is that Altman and Spielberg and Coppola and a lot of those great filmmakers from the 70s, frankly, have resources that I've never had. And you could go and try to shoot a movie like Apocalypse Now without a script, you know, and you know, there was something <laughs> there was like something very exciting about finding the movie, you know, while you shot it. But frankly, you know, I was very aware that resources like that for a black 
film were going to be really hard to come by. And I don't know this for a fact, but I assume that Spike also, you know, Do the Right Thing is such a tight, tight script. It is. And um, I think probably he was frustrated. I And again, I'm just imagining. I don't know. But I, I imagine that he was frustrated uh, trying to make school days under the studio system and um, knew that he needed to really have a narratively tight version of that format if he was going to do it again. I don't know. That's my guess. And, uh, and But I recognize that, certainly. Is that like... Uh, and also, I love words. You know, um, I, I fell in love with storytelling as a theater student at a performing arts high school in Houston and, you know, learned very early on that like the great playwrights, their words are so intentional, the syllables they're using, the consonants, everything is so intentional. And so when I write, I write with a lot of intention. Um, it's already gone through a bit of a grinder to get to the page. And uh, I'm not against improv, but I, I think improv is a very specific skill. And I, it's very hard for me to rely on it. Uh, I, I really need to come into my sets because I usually have limited time, limited money, limited, you know, everything. And we got I got to know that I got the scene when I left. So uh, usually I got to come in, you know, with a pretty clear idea of what I want, get that. And then maybe we can play. This is this is like independent filmmaking 101, because, uh, you know, honestly, I don't know a single independent filmmaker who can kind of take the the risks that, you know, something like that. But I mean, you compare yourself like something like to Andrew Haig, what he did with Weekend, mm. which was very, very highly improv, but still yeah. shot in a very tremendously, it's just a different style. And the yeah. style that you have is very lush and, and honestly, as much as you say you love words, extraordinarily visual. Yeah, I mean, look, it's, it's, it's however you think you can best tell the story. You know, I know that I, I like improv, but I love language and I love writing and I love, um, turning the written word into performance but that's just me that's not like the best way it's just my way and you know especially at that time I didn't want to do I didn't want to work in that cinema verite style I I've embraced it a lot more recently but at the start of my career it felt like everything that was black felt like a documentary or it felt raw or it just felt like a rule that black people and black conversations had to kind of show up in this edgy cinema verite docu style. And there was nothing wrong with that. But I just I wanted to do something else. I wanted to say, yeah, but I love this kind of cinema that is very, you know, you're very aware that a director is is showing you how to look at the world. And, and I never saw black stories or black faces in that kind of cinema. And so I wanted to bring us to them. And that's why the movie especially is constantly visually quoting old movies and as much as i've talked about that movie we've i've never really unpacked i mean we are the, like every scene in that movie is referencing something because part of what i'm saying is like we when we think of cinema history we don't see black faces in these frames and that psychologically has been telling us that maybe we don't deserve to think of ourselves or our lives as as artful and spiritual and lush in the way that we can think of white people's lives and so um it's a very subtle element of the movie but uh, at that time anyway it was really really important uh, that I could say, no, dear white people can fit alongside um, these sort of older, great cinema classics that we normally don't think black people should show up in. I, I think that that's really what is so revolutionary about Do the Right Thing is that it's shot, it, it's shot with such a point of view. Uh, it doesn't, it is, it's both slice of life, but it's also, it lives in a cinema reality all of its own. And that, that sort of storytelling was, was really reserved for white or maybe even European stories, um, up until that time. Absolutely. And it, it's funny that you talk about all the references in the film. Uh, it's been, a, it's been a minute since I've seen the film, but I do remember thinking that. And I mean, I guess what you're saying is you kind of subconsciously or subliminally are almost rewriting some of cinema history to kind of bring black faces into these places where, you know, you'd think of like a Howard Hawks movie or you'd think of like, absolutely, you know, an early Hitchcock or whatever. And it's like, you don't see anybody like that, but now you can kind of make it and emulate it and kind of like give a nod or a nudge. Yeah. I mean, you know, the scene where, and, and we reference it a couple times in the show too. And it was the first idea I ever came up with visually for the movie. And it's in the teaser trailer that we made to finance the movie. But it's um it's a visual quote from Metropolis, Fritz Lang's Metropolis. And it's when all of the, the black kids are at the movie theater protesting the choices that they have of black movies to watch. And uh, the reason I visually quoted Metropolis is because Metropolis is sort of thought of as like the, the great first science fiction movie. But what was on Fritz Lang's mind specifically was social revolution and why the working class 
was sort of held down and kept underground by the bourgeoisie. Well, you know, that that's an issue that nobody, not nobody, but I think people at the time weren't really thinking about black people or weren't thinking about like in a racial way. But boy, is that a it's an analogy for what is going on with uh, with race in America. And I thought, well, let's stick black faces in that, you know, not black face, mind you, but actual black faces in that frame and let you know that this frame is very intentional. It is even if you don't know what it's referencing, you know that it's referencing something. And and that by itself, I thought was very powerful. Uh, and we do that a bunch. We do that a bunch in that movie. <laughs> <laughs> what are your favorite movies? Not the best. No, just the ones that you come back to and the directors you come back to most often. Oh, wow. Um, I know it's it's a horrible question, but, you know, I want to know. I I mean, I watch a lot of Kubrick. Uh, I, I always go back to Kubrick. I just think um, he's just one of the greatest American filmmakers. Um, but I also really love Brian De Palma. Uh, and I really love, I love Bergman and... Um, Capra films. I, I'm kind of all over the place. I, I sort of what happens with me is I get really obsessed with one aspect of filmmaking and I sort of rabbit hole in that direction for a minute. And so I have like I have all these weird gaps in my film knowledge, like every, every, all of the time a filmmaker or a friend would be like, have you seen this? And I'm like, I haven't like what? Are you? you know, but I can also, <laughs> you know, but I can I can I don't know. I can pontificate about any specific lane uh, that I've, I've been interested. So I'm I'm all over the place. But I would say, um, yeah, I'm always returning to Kubrick. Um, I'm always returning to that same group of '70s uh, sort of filmmakers, like Mike Nichols and um, Coppola, and uh, I, I think I've said it already, De Palma. Um, that sort of came out of that that sort of you know post studio system model. But I'm all over the place, man. <laughs> <laughs> And I, I watch a lot of trash as well. Trash is always very important. You I can think find trash some is amazing actually, stuff in trash. I think trash is really important. I think it, you know, I, it might be killing the film industry. I don't know. But I, I have really stopped apologizing for watching things like The Real Housewives or wherever because <laughs> it's important to recognize that these things really do work in, in terms of narrative function. They do. Like, you know, a, a, a poorly, not poorly, but a, a moderately edited, okayly scripted, badly acted episode of The Real Housewives of Beverly Hills, for instance, can sometimes be more effective than a really well-crafted narrative short. And we, if we may agree or disagree with that, but we have to know that and maybe know why that is. Um, so as a storyteller, I, I, I find I get just as much out of the crap, the schlock, that I watch that still seems to work on me anyway, you know, as I do from like the bravura filmmakers that I'm discovering on Criterion or something. You know, All right, like, I want to oh know, I want to know what, aside from television, what schlock movies do you love though? Oh, you know, it's, I, I actually, I'm more of a schlock TV guy than a movie guy. Okay. When I, when I watch a schlock movie, it makes me really depressed. I don't know <laughs> why. <laughs> Well, I, I guess it, it depends on what you call schlock. I mean, it's like, is, is like Hudson Hawk schlock? I mean, that's a movie, that's a bad movie that I just have seen so many times and I love yeah. it. And I don't apologize for it anymore. I think it's brilliant and hilarious and ridiculous and, and yet terrible, but wonderful at the same time. <laughs> it's a wonderful, terrible movie. I mean, okay, so my... I love The Wiz, and I know. Oh, it's a good movie. That's a good well, Sidney Lumet. It's. I mean, it's okay. It's not a good movie. <laughs> it's not, okay. I I do agree. It is actually not a good movie. It's not certainly one of Sidney Lumet's better moments. But it's such no. a weird collision it's, of of like influences. You've got Sidney Lumet over here, who's like one of the greatest American filmmakers ever. Yeah. Doing this big musical does not seem to really get a handle on it and yet no. you have this production design this costume design these like all this stuff and it's like Quincy this... Jones yeah. score is honestly maybe one of the best musical scores I've ever heard and because it bombed nope like we've never done better I honestly I feel like Quin what Quincy <laughs> Jones did with the music in that movie is mind-blowing and no other adaptation from Broadway to uh, Hollywood in my opinion has really expanded the sound of a musical quite as much as Quincy Jones did with The Wiz um, you know The Wiz gives us off the wall and thriller it gives us a, yep. a, a a sort of rebooted Diana Ross it 
Um, so many culturally important things come from The Wiz, but it, it's kind of a failure. And and it took me a while to see it because I loved it as a kid, and I still watch it all of the time. But now I can finally see like, oh, I get why this is a bad movie. But I I just love it, and I think it's okay to have a personal relationship with with movies. You know? Oh God, yes. Um, and Quincy Jones, I know that Criterion Channel did that whole thing on Quincy Jones scores. Oh, yes, like yes. I watched at least Speaking three of, of those. Speaking of Sidney yeah, he's oh my he's God, so great, an, incredibly. He's done so much in his career um, that it seems preposterous to say that you know he's underrated, but he really is <laughs> when it comes to movie scores. He, he was he's a phenomenal composer. Let's talk about your podcast. Yeah. Um, don't at me, and you should, it's with the at sign. You should look it up. It's amazing. You've had gotten some amazing people on your podcast. Uh, Barry Jenkins, Lena Waithe, Anna DuVernay, Issa Rae, uh, I mean, Ted Sarandos, which is, which is <laughs> which, oh, good for you. Papa Get, Ted came on. I was just going to say, like, you know, yeah, season four, daddy, give it to me. <laughs> um, but it's an amazing podcast. Uh, you know, you can get it on any of these uh, these podcast apps. But, I mean, what led you to go into a podcast? Well, you know, it was around the time um, I was finishing up season two of Dear White People. And my publicity team at the time was like, you know, how do we get your voice, honestly, in front of white people, old white people? <laughs> And I, you know, I love KCRW. I love NPR. And so I was like, well, let's go there. And we did. And, um, you know, they were looking for new voices. And yeah, we did a season one of this podcast. And, and really, it was just me talking to my friends. You know, Ava DuVernay and I are friends. Lena Waithe and I are friends. Barry Jenkins and I are friends. And it really kind of became this sort of like notes from the Renaissance kind of thing where it was just like black creatives really just talking about what it's like. And um and I think we did pretty okay. You know, I think that the, um, I guess KCRW really scaled back massively their podcast output uh, mm -hmm. around that time. And so now we're sort of regrouping and figuring out how to do the show independently, which is fun, um, actually. But it's one of those things that, like, it's something between a hobby and something that just I, I just enjoy because I get to have conversations with people that I normally wouldn't have. And um, and it's the thing I'm asked about the most, I, I would say, uh, just anecdotally from people. That's fantastic. And I can basically say the same for this podcast. It's, yeah, you know, it's, it's been it's, you know, it's it's a it's a wonderful opportunity to talk to people, uh, yeah. especially like about awesome movies and stuff it, like that. It's like it's like the coffee dates you always promise to have, but never quite find time for these podcast interviews are like, you know, they're sanctioned ways to have really intellectual conversations, I guess. And, <laughs> I don't know. So tell me about Bad Hair, which I've been hearing about like for what, at least a couple years now, and I am <laughs> absolutely desperate to see because this the the synopsis is so great. I cannot <laughs> wait to see it. Tell us what it's about. It's nuts. I mean, it's about um, it's about a girl in 1989, um, Los Angeles in the in the music industry who to get ahead as a VJ uh, gets a weave. And 1989 is sort of the year where weaves kind of become available for, for black women en masse. And it turns out that um, even though the weave is really helping her career by day, it, it has a body count by night. It, it is a <laughs> literal <laughs> killer weave and it needs blood to survive. And um, it was a way to sort of use the psycho thriller, which is a genre that I just love and that a lot of my favorite directors have made just the nuttiest movies in um, because you can be kind of nuts and really go balls to the wall cinema, but also like say something important. And I learned a lot doing it. And uh, yeah, I, you know, it's going to spark all kinds of conversations with people <laughs> who will love it. People maybe will feel traumatized by it. I'm not sure. Um, but it, it felt like the next thing I had to do. It, it was it was like the anti-polish of Dear White People as well. Like I just wanted to kind of break out of that little jewel box that I had made for myself with the first movie and just really use all the tools of cinema to say something. Little Shop of Hair Horrors? Yes, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and there's like, you know, there's a fair degree of camp and um, 
I mean, it's a movie about a killer weave, so you, it has to have some camp. Uh, and there's some laughs there, too. But it's it's a very serious, you know, movie. It's a very serious movie about a killer weave. Do we know, I, I, and I know that you guys, at, you know, I think we said this before, uh, had a big deal out of Sundance, one of the biggest sales out of Sundance this year that there was, uh, to Hulu. But I think I read, and tell me if I'm wrong, you were talking about a theatrical release as well. Yeah. Now, in, co- in COVID land, who knows what's getting a theatrical release? Nobody knows anything right now. That's true. But yeah. do, we ha- do you have any schedule about, like, when uh, when you might think this might come out? Yeah, I mean, we... So, I, I don't think I can announce it yet, but I know for certain when it'll hit Hulu... Okay. And uh, we've been talking with Hulu since Sundance about what a theatrical release would look like leading up to that. You know, I think, like you said, because of COVID, there's so much uncertainty that um, every week there's sort of kind of a new scenario that we talk about. Um, but, I, you know, either way, I, I'm just I just I'm ready for the movie to just be out. I've been working on it for so <laughs> long. And uh, yeah, I, it's time. It's time for it to come out. It's time for the conversations to start. It's time for people to drag me and celebrate me. It's time. Let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> hopefully not an equal measure. Well, hopefully, but you never know. I mean, that's sort of what that's what I learned from Dear White People is sort of. You know, if you dare to get in the ring, you have to be a little open to the dragging because when you're a part of a marginalized group and you're making something for and about people who normally don't get to see themselves in stories, you know, it's a lot. It's it's going to hit different. (laughs) It's just going to hit different. And one of the things I I was I was going to talk about um, uh, was that when you originally came out with the trailer for Dear White People, you got pushback from people who called you anti-white oh, because, yeah. because of that trailer, which is, especially now, is totally absurd. But even at the time, was completely absurd. Yeah. I mean, the movie and the show are really about, like, how do you deal with white fragility? Right. Because if you can't tell a liberal, cool, not racist white person, hey, this is racism, if you can't talk to them... You're well, doing air can't... quotes. I just want to let everyone know who's not seeing this. You're doing air quotes when you're saying the, the, the not racist part. And the... Yeah, it's like, if, if I can't... <laughs> you know, the feeling was, like, in 2014 and, and beyond, like, if I can't say as a black person, this is racist without you making it about you and being offended <laughs> that you were called racist, well, then I can't really do anything. And so it was horrifying to see, but it was also kind of proof of the concept that like white fragility is getting in the way of what we actually need to get done here i'm so you know i have to spend so much energy and time assuring you that like i'm not talking about you or you know whatever it is you know or if i am i don't hold it against you yeah whatever it is that they need to hear it's like you realizing that you're racist is like like step one like there are so many other steps and it's like we could never <laughs> get past that first step because people were so outraged and and the thing i kept thinking about is like it's not it's not fuck white people it's not i hate white pe- it's dear white people it's like it's how you start a letter it's a it's an invitation to have a conversation what are people so offended by but then you realize well white people aren't used to being called white they're not used to being thought of as a race which you know is mind-boggling but uh, i guess a necessary first step because they, think, <laughs> it's the, they think it's the default they think it's it's and by them I, thinking it's the default is your point exactly yes and and you, you what you don't realize is the rest of us have to think of ourselves as something like off-brand of the default you know but it seems like people are are slowly getting the message um <laughs> But every time we did something, dear white people, there was outrage. I mean, the, when it was a Twitter account, there was outrage. When the teaser trailer, when the, the sales trailer I, I made just to get the movie financed, there was outrage. When the movie came out, outrage. First season, outrage. I mean, it was, it was at a certain point, it was like, did I, where, where were they in, when we made the movie and the first season? Like, how are you still upset? Like, I don't understand. Like, One might say that shows that you're doing something right. I guess so. It feels... <laughs> Very weird um, to constantly, and I think that's the other thing that's interesting about this moment is that black creators, whether they're doing something like Dear White People or Insecure or whatever the show might be, this, we're constantly having to defend it, both from white people and, you know, black people who are somehow unnerved by just our being in the room um, and daring to say things that no one has said before. Uh, It's a constant, like, constant struggle and challenge to not respond. I mean, I I have a Twitter account, but I I haven't been on Twitter in months because I just... 
emotionally i can't do it like i just can't deal with people's bullshit well, it's a lot, <laughs> you know? but it's a lot right now too i mean uh, one of the things i've been asking you know people that i've been talking to is you know how are you dealing with the pandemic and 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 uh you know kind of staying in and kind of making decisions whether or not to see friends or or do the virtually or whatever yeah i mean i've been we've been really cautious uh i haven't really been seeing folks i mean obviously like i went down to the protest yesterday and um you know occasionally there'll be like a porch visit or a drive-by or something like that but i don't want to catch this thing man like this shit sounds scary as hell and it sounds real and i the way i contribute to this moment is as an artist and this artist needs to be able to show up on a set hopefully this year to shoot um a very ambitious season of television and so for me, it's been about, you know, maybe being overly cautious about my own safety and, and my boyfriend's safety um, and my family's safety. Um, but, you know, I'm also an introvert. So the world shutting down for me is not like a nightmare scenario. Like there's a lot of things about this scenario that are nightmarish. Um Having to take meetings from home for me is not one of those <laughs> aspects. Um, not having to be in my car all day, not having to like wait in the way like just deal with people has been kind of great for me um so and it's been it's given me a lot of space and room to really do the soul searching and the therapy and the meditation and all the stuff that i need to sort of take care of my my psychology so do you meditate every day i chant i'm a um a nietzschean buddhist so i chant uh i meditate a lot too but uh my practice is that i chant every day Nam Yoho Renge Kyo, in case you're curious. And just like Tina Turner and What's Love Got to Do With It. And uh, <laughs> and, I, and I go to therapy three times a week. <laughs> oh, wow. How long have you and your boyfriend been together? Oh, boy. We've been together for over six years now. Well, congratulations. Yeah, yeah. Six How'd you meet? We met on Tinder um, at a time when I... And it was just like everyone said. It was like, once you stop wanting a boyfriend, you'll get one. And I literally was like... That's I don't what need to a, me too. Yeah, it was like I don't want a boyfriend. I just want to get drinks and hang out and make out with people. And mm -hmm. then I I met this boy on Tinder and his name is Rick Proctor and we had a drink and six years later like you know <laughs> that is adorable we're totally booed up yeah <laughs> i have to say i was uh everybody seems to have a story this is actually your your version is actually more pg rated than almost everyone i know <laughs> including well, me i met my boyfriend on scruff which was a definitely not tinder well no very very different intention there i and met it just, people just on there on there on there too it just it didn't ever turn out to be anything <laughs> You know, Tinder wasn't the only thing I was on. It just happened to be the, the one where I met Rick. <laughs> so one thing I'm asking people when they talk to like up and coming artists and, and creatives, especially during this time when we're all trying to kind of just get through and be creative, aside from the advice, just do it. What advice would you give, you know, up and coming filmmakers, artists, writers, performers? Um, I would, I always say this, I, I really think we need to be taking our mental health a lot more seriously. Um, and when I say mental health, I, I don't just mean go to therapy. I don't just mean like, find some space for yourself. But the thing is, like, we're, you know, artists, and we're very sensitive, our instrument is our minds and our psyches. And um, it's very confusing to sort out your childhood trauma and your shame and your art and your it is so easy to get caught up uh, in some very negative space places, you know, I, I would say that I've been the most depressed since my breakthrough in Hollywood and since I've found quote unquote success. And I think that like, if we are to be useful in these moments, we really do have to slow down and think about our trauma and our and ourselves and and um, and take care of ourselves. It feels it feels like in a in a capitalist society, particularly in America, that like it's all about production. You have to make, 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 make. And what I've realized is that if you just make, 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 make and never repair and never take care, it not only does your work suffer, but it just stops being it stops being fun. And the reason we're here is because it's fun. It, it has to stay fun or else, you know, that wonderful spirit that made us want to do it in the first place gets extinguished and we just become worker drones. We become craftsmen. We, we, we cease to be artists. And um, that liberating freedom that we feel when we make art has to, we have to protect that. And for me, that's been about uh, 
really taking my mental health seriously enough to say things like I go to therapy three times a week. Why? No, I'm not in a men- I'm not in crisis. I'm not sort of dealing, you know, I- I'm dealing with everyday stuff, but it's just that important to me. I am thrilled that you said that because I think even as, especially as gay men, there's this stigma about mental health and taking care of our mental health. And a lot of people, especially artists, don't want to talk about depression and don't want to talk about anxiety and how difficult it is. And it was only a few years ago, I'm in my 40s, it was only a few years ago when I actually started to get the tools that I needed, that I wish I had had in my 20s, sure, to deal yeah. with this stuff. And and my life has improved dramatically. Yeah, it's, you know, especially because I think we're also well adjusted, you know, especially if you're in Hollywood, we've all learned to be fine when we're really not fine in ways that we're not, we can't possibly be aware of. I mean, one of the great insights of psychology is that human beings have an unconscious. We have parts of ourselves that we are not aware of that affect what we do and how we feel. And um, therapy is a great way to get in touch with those parts uh, because there's a lot of pain and trauma that we can't see, we can't feel, we can't sort of work out what's getting in our way. And, uh, you know, a lot of that stuff is stuff we actually can control if, if we sort of take the time to, to do that. Well, Justin, I think that's a wonderful place to leave it. Uh, I am just blown away by this. Thank you so much. It's so wonderful talking to you. Thank I, you, Dave. And I Good so look you. forward to season four. Hopefully yes. it will happen knocking on wood. Yes, sir. Thank you, Justin Simeon. This has been The Outcast, presented by Outfest. For more, go to outfest.org slash The Outcast. The Outcast is executive produced by Ismail El-Sharif and Ellen Konigsberg. Special thanks to Damian Navarro and the entire Outfest team. Music by West One Music Group. For more information about Outfest, the film festival, the programs, and all the ways that you can help support LGBT voices, go to outfest.org. The Outcast is a production of Milton Ventures Media and Triple Fire Productions. I'm David Kittredge. Thank you so much for listening and catch you next time.